Welcome, Sylvia, to the Collaborative Research Center 1182 Origin and Function of Meta Organisms. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, uh, you made a major step and jump from Hawaii, not directly to us, but you are now in Switzerland and uh, so um, and doing a postdoc there. So that gives us the chance to have you here as our guest. You gave a seminar uh, earlier today with uh, spectacular findings on the role of small RNAs in communicating with uh, the little famous squid and. Uh, so my first question would be, how did you find the squid? You uh, got your PhD in Wisconsin, you, you went to Wisconsin for your PhD, but how did you find out there? And uh, what is so fascinating about this little creature that it kept you going for several years and uh, you moved from Wisconsin with Margaret McFall to, to Hawaii and found out that all these surprising new aspects, which we talk later about. How did you find the squid? So it was actually during my undergrad. In, I had a general microbiology class where we touched the topic of symbiosis. Mm -hmm. And because the system is so beautiful, that's one of the system that it was taught to us. And I just found it beautiful. Like I wanted to work with it. So when I finished my undergrad, I happened to see a seminar of Margaret that she was, um, I think it was in Paris. So right after she finished her fin seminar, I asked, sent her an email saying like this, you know, this was meant to be, <laughs> I really want, I, I really wanted to work with the system. And I, by then when I sent the email, I didn't even know they were in Wisconsin. Uh, I picture them somewhere near an ocean. <laughs> um, so it was it was quite an adventure, but it's been it's been very nice to work with this system. Uh, let's come back to that. Uh, how you found the squid? Because obviously you were very f you just found an interesting question, an interesting object, and you did not even know where the. PI and the supervisor was located in the world. You didn't, you didn't care, but you wanted to work on that. That's an important point I would like to come back uh, later on. So then you, so you started your PhD and you found the f your famous squid and then um, you did fantastic work. You just told um, the participants of a webinar um, the new findings, which also to, to you and to Margaret McFall and um, Ned Ruby were surprising at the very beginning. Maybe can you summarize in a, in a few sentences uh, the major observations, uh, which so f now in the meantime already published in, in wonderful publications and in great journals. Can you summarize just so that, we kn that our listeners know um, what, uh, what you were about uh, to discover? So we discovered that a symbiotic bacteria can use a small RNA to direct the host to change its normal uh, response, let's say, to, to the symbiosis. And a large portion of these changes that this small RNA is doing within the host goes towards um, kind of calming the new reaction of the host. So in that way, increases the um, opportunity of the bacteria to persistently colonize the host tissue and deliver that way their beneficial effects of the interactions. So um, it's a uh, highly conserved uh, bacteria RNA that is having a um, specific housekeeping function within the bacteria. And we were very su surprised of how this in this system, in this association, was specifically recruited into this bacterium host communication during the initiation of the symbiosis. Fascinating and, uh, and uh, a wonderful discovery, um, particular because you didn't plan to discover that. It just, the discovery came to you. And uh, as the squid came to you, you didn't look for the squid, but the squid came to you. Um, but let's uh, spend a, one minute on the term highly conserved. And uh, so highly conserved, we all in the symbiosis field, we are trying to uncover conserved concept concepts, how do symbionts and hosts uh, stay together 
and uh, um, first of all meet and then they stay together and they keep that symbiosis going and uh, we try and, and ask ourselves all the time are there conserved uh, components in that interaction now you you talk about your, your term conserved means a little bit different it means that within the bacteria there is a highly conserved small RNA which has housekeeping functions and this symbiont now uses this highly conserved small RNA to manage and to maintain or to stabilize, uh, to provide fitness components for the host. Um, my question would be, now this is the wonderful famous squid system, what would you conceptually take out of that observations in terms of if you would now write a review on symbiosis in general, um, how and, and uh, what would you tell the, the symbiosis community? What can one learn from that type of observation, which is very specific for this type of bacteria, which lives which lives in that species of squid, Oiprimna? When you think about you know the classical view of um, host microbe interaction. It's always um, put within the scope of protein, protein overview, receptor protein interaction. And when you think about which kind of uh, molecules are involved, if proteins are involved, they are also conserved among you know, organisms. So you have bacteria, um, you know, gram negative, you have LPS, then you have many organisms that have receptors that sense this kind of uh, bacteria products. Um, so in the sense, in that sense, now RNA, that is also in our case, a conserved molecule, as you were saying, is just that is a molecule that is present among bacteria. It can also, like if you put it into evolutionary perspective, maybe it was also used because it's always there. Um, so now, now the host can use it as a um, way of you know, knowing what is there. And maybe because it's RNA, it's a kind of an additional way of tweaking the interaction between both of them because RNA is easily degradable. So, um, that is a really good point to have it a signaling from the bacteria for the host to be able to really monitor in real time what is happening. And we don't know if this is, um, you know, is, will happen in other system, but at least in, in ours, um, it has um, really effects on the host detecting this small RNA. Yeah, so that's of course the power of, uh, of model systems. Each model has its own message, uh, but together uh, by studying many different models, which we can do now, we may get an overall idea how this living and being and functioning together really works. Uh, let's talk a little bit away from your own, from the specific research you did in the last few years. And uh, so you've found that squid symbiosis system so fascinating that you tried to be part of this and getting part of the community there working on Alprimna. Um, thinking back by myself about 30 years or 40 years, the symbiosis community was very small and this were very few people were working on very eclectic uh, model systems. There were a few corals and there was maybe the hydra. And uh, so, but now this symbiosis research, this community, it's now called host microbe interactions and uh, uh, is growing um, enormously. What do you think is the reason behind that? What is so fascinating on symbiosis? And obviously it also, was somehow triggering you and you then picked up one model system in the symbiosis community. So what's, uh, what makes symbiosis research for you so fascinating? When you think about all the new technologies that we had that allows us to get here, right? Before, we didn't know how many microbes we, you know, were surrounding us or how important all these microbes were for our whole physi uh, physiology. So is um, I just find fascinating how 
so very different organisms can work together um, in like in very different systems, right? So it's um, one thing that Margaret always says and stayed in my in my head is like how difficult is to find an example where there is no symbiosis whatsoever and that's kind of really uh, um, st stuck with me it seems to be a fundamental uni a fundamental component of life in general and uh, i always have these discussions with margaret where maybe one can f look for germ free or bacteria free or symbiont free organisms but um, it's hard to find them. They are certainly in minority, and uh, the, the majority is being symbiotic. Now, you touched briefly on key word, which probably is one of the reasons why symbiosis research is so, gro so much growing now, and that's technological progress. So, of course, we can now sequence and we can do all kinds of things. And you have, uh, you use an, an enormous spectrum of genetic uh, tools uh, to to squeeze out answers from your symbionts uh, in terms of making them mutant and not producing these small RNAs, etc. Um, how important is that for you? I mean, uh, also moving now, as far as I understand, in a more system uh, biology approach. I mean, is technology something which um, is a major part of the fascination in that field? Yes, of course, because it allows us to go in from um, a field was very descriptive for a very, very long time. Um, you know, so it was more about which bacteria were, were in which conditions and so on, so on. And now, like with all these new technologies, it has allowed us to go deeper into really understanding the functionality of it, right? And um, really, I think, it's and with time for the future too um, that it really helps to demonstrate for demonstrate for example symbiotic mechanisms that right now is they are out of our grasp and um, so we know now that microbial symbionts have huge effects not only in the symbiotic side the symbiosis itself that's association but also across the, the whole body, right? Like our physiology is intertwined with the microbes that surround us. And I think this, this new technology will really help us to go deeper in, in, the, in the understanding of the specific mechanisms that I use for microbes to, you know, to communicate, to modulate, because at the end they are also modulated the, ho the host response, the same way that host modulate the response depending on who is there. I want to come back a little bit to the technology and the different disciplines which we are, which we have to use now to get to the deep answers. And um, before that, maybe if if you look back on yourself, I mean, you did a very an excellent PhD, and uh, you are now on an, in an excellent institution for most very likely an excellent second postdoc. So, and I'm see I see you you are on the way of a brilliant career um, what do you consider if you now want you you talk now to some of our undergraduates uh, who are listening and who see you as a role model of how she made it and uh, she moved from somewhere to Hawaii to Wisconsin from Hawaii to Switzerland if you think back what is important what would you tell a female or a male junior undergraduate student um, interested in principle, interested in basic research, but not really knowing at that stage of the personal life uh, life uh, stage what it really means to be a basic researcher. What are important points in your mind uh, and maybe crucial that a career of a female researcher in goes on so well, um, what would you say? I think I will start with just genuine curiosity. Um, I think that's a very important factor to have um, because, you know, sometimes in science it has to keep going and um, doesn't mean that it's gonna lead anywhere, but sometimes it does. And when it does, it's so satisfying 
that you forget about all the troubles that you had before, right? right. And with that, I think, you know, persistence is also very important. Um, so, yeah, persistence, because again, I, something sometimes things do not work the first time. Sometimes you have an idea and you think this is what is gonna go. And then the truth is not that, right? And it doesn't go your way, but you keep going. And for example, in from my personal experience, all this um, story that we found that is beautiful with small earnings story, we were not looking for it. It just appeared, we were doing other projects and it's just my curiosity is that what is this small RNA that is seeing so much abundance in the blood of the squid in here and how is getting there? So we just went into, okay, so let's see, it's coming from the light organ, which is the source of the symbiosis. Um, let's see what it is, just localizing it. And like that way you kind of go um, pulling the rope and you, find, you can find beautiful things. But at the same time, it can lead nowhere, right? But um, when it does, it's yes, it's beautiful. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I see uh, this is uh, the beauty also of talking to young people like you. I see the shining eyes because you are, uh, yes, and uh, this is what keeps us going. I mean, we are just fascinated by the nature. Um, so uh, we identified uh, curiosity and we identified persistence. Um, when I talk to undergraduate students in my institution, I always, sometimes I have the feeling um, it's hard for them to leave their comfort zone and to leave their area where they are. So, I mean, I, you are a wonderful example where you didn't care where this famous Margaret Milfall is somewhere sitting. You didn't even know. You just wrote her a mail, and uh, if she, an email, and if she would have uh, been in the Antarctic, I guess you would have gone to the Antarctic and uh, uh, studied with her there, uh, this tropical fish. So um, isn't mobility something which people have to bring with, and the, uh, the, the, um, the flexibility uh, that you have to, now you, are, you jump from Hawaii to Switzerland. Is mo isn't mobility another factor? I think so. If you, I mean, you might be really lucky and the science that it happens that you love is close by, but that's usually is not the case. And um, I think you have to see other things in order to you know, become a good researcher. Not, not everybody does, does science the same way. And um, I think it's important to see other points of view. So mobility, yes, is important. I don't think it's completely necessary. I think it's hard as a, from the personal view of, you know, you kind of universal roots somewhere because you are, you know, I spent two years in Madison, five in Hawaii now and coming here. Um, also, it's going to be temporary. Um, so, it's, it, it's hard, but it's also gratifying from what you get from there. Coming back once more to technology, I think part of the progress which our field makes is due that we leave disciplines, we leave, as Margaret always calls it, the silos. Uh, we are, I'm a developmental biologist, um, but for making progress, we have to uh, involve colleagues from different, from very different disciplines, and we have to learn to talk to them, and uh, you have to learn to bring your interest into their brain, so that you can interest their brain, and then it helps you. So this interdisciplinarity, I think, is a major is a major aspect which um, will shape the future, working together with. Um, Modelers with mathematicians. Uh, uh, with, I mean, you you jumped from Margaret's lab to Ned's lab to a microbiologist, uh, and uh, so is that. Um, for me, that's also very fascinating and interesting. I love to work with people from different disciplines out of my own discipline, sometimes more than with people from my own discipline. But uh, what do you think about interdisciplinarity and the importance? I think it brings 
a lot to any kind of research when you have an inter interdisciplinary section because um, it's there is danger in just looking, you know, very specifically of what you are doing. And when you have kind of the richness that brings having people from different disciplines, they, they see things in a different way. And it sometimes is hard to be in the position that you are kind of in the middle between two disciplines because you have to learn how to talk to one, how to talk to another. But um, I think it's very important to be able to be in that situation too. Um, because it really brings a lot to the field. When we now bring all that together, what we have uh, talked about, and uh, now considering that you have now made a very tough and uh, another strong decision, uh, and you go to a new, you are you're already there uh, to a new institution, what what do you expect from an institution? Um, in which you have now chosen to go to? So I, I actually was very um, happy to come in a place like this that I've been in the University of Lausanne because actually one of the, the kind of um, good things and positive things that I saw when I was looking for positions is that there is a consortium of very different fields and um, yes, in, in this case, it's focused on, on microbiome, but you have host animal, animal uh, microbe uh, symbiosis, plants, then you have synthetic biology, you have all the mobilist mathematic, mathematicians and everything. And that is so, um, you know, it's really <laughs> um, an enrichment. I don't know how to say that in English, but. <laughs> Like I've gone out of the U.S. and my English is gone, um, but uh, yeah, it's it, it's just beautiful how you can bring people that think so differently and do so the very different things working on the same thing, and that definitely it play a part on my decision to come here. The institution you are now in offers you this type of different. Uh, disciplines, technologies, approaches, systems, and uh, so you, yes, certainly a very good decision, which is particular if you are, you are not at the end of your career, so it, it will enrich your life, and I wish you all the best for that. Uh, we are coming to an end of that small chat, but uh, let me ask one last question, which is affecting all of us, of course. We are not living in normal times. We are living in a pandemic which nobody ever has foreseen and which has which affects us heavily. How do you cope with that? And you even made a major transition now from Hawaii to Switzerland during that time. I mean, how do you manage? And uh, so what's your, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, uh, your career is uh, just started and ongoing and I, all your peers certainly will support you. But still, I mean, you are living in this time now and uh, so what are your thoughts on that it's tough like for everybody it's gonna it's, it's, it's just tough and uh, that's how it is uh, moving uh, in the middle of a pandemic is it's very difficult um saying goodbye without really being able to say goodbye properly and uh, that's really hard and also coming to a new place where you don't really have the social interactions that you were supposed to have, right? Like now everything is online. So for even though it's, you know, it's tough, we have to adapt and it's just being reachable and being there, yes, using, as we were talking about technologies, is using uh, the online the platforms that we have online that we can uh, be up to date and be still in touch with people and um, still is not the same, but um, that's something that we have to live with. But I will say even for me at the beginning, I was a bit, um, how you say, um, I could not, uh, it was very difficult when the first week that I arrived to the lab because it's not the same as 
uh, you know, you have someone next to your office and you have a small question and you just go like, oh, by the way, and then you have this friendly uh, kind of interaction, your chat now is more directed, right? Like you ask a question online, uh, you know, like we are using Slack, for example, or email or whatever you are using, it has more uh, kind of... Uh, <laughs> directed more aggressive let's say it this way right but i think we have to i mean that's the way it is right now and and at the end of the day it's everybody is doing the same thing so that's that's it. try to still keep in, in touch with people even though it's not in person yeah exactly i think this is just uh, what we all have to do and uh, being still optimistic uh, that will another time will come uh, Sylvia, it was so great to have you, unfortunately, as our virtual, but at least as our guest, as a seminar speaker, and now in this interview, I um, wish you all the best, and I truly hope that we meet again in, in a more normal situation. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you for sharing your personal views with us. Uh, thank you, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been very nice. Bye.